So there, there were good reasons to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin or will be coming back to earth to, to judge the living and the dead. These beliefs would be part of our rational scientific description of the universe. These are claims about physics. These are claims about biology. The only reason why a person needs faith to accept these claims is because the evidence for them is remarkably thin. So I, I really think it is time we admitted that faith is really the permission that religious people give one another to, to believe things strongly when reasons fail. I think it's important to point out there is no other area in our discourse where we consider this an acceptable practice. Now, there are, of course, many people who argue that there is no conflict between religion and science. How do they do this? Well, here, here's how the trick is done. Uh, first, they argue that, that science cannot prove that God does not exist. You know, atheism is a faith. Atheism, atheism is the faith that there is no God. Uh, can you prove that Jesus was not the Son of God? Can you prove that he did not rise from the dead on the third day? No. Now, I find it amazing how much, how much work these maneuvers actually do for people. It seems to me that Bertrand Russell, I think as many of you know, closed the door to this kind of thinking for all time with his, his famous celestial teapot argument. I mean, can we prove that there's not a China teapot in elliptical orbit around the sun at this moment? No. Does it make it reasonable to believe in the existence of such a teapot? No. Is it reasonable to be agnostic about such a teapot? Not quite. <laughs> End of argument. I mean, the, the, it's obvious that the burden is not upon the atheist to prove the absence of celestial teapots. And the, and the real irony here, which I think we have to point out relentlessly, is that every religious person recognizes this with respect to the other guy's religion. I mean, every Christian knows exactly what it's like to be an atheist with respect to Islam. I mean, the Muslims think they have the, a book, the Quran, which is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Why do they think so? Because it says so in the book. Not a good argument. <laughs> Every Christian recognizes this with respect to Islam, but, th but they don't turn the same criticism upon their own discourse. I think we, we must oblige them to. Now, there's a second trick that purports to reconcile religion and science. And it's one that, quite frankly, has taken in many scientists. So the, the trick tends to surface whenever a specific piece of scientific data is being talked about and, try, and, and reconciled with, with uh, religion. In the, in the face of any scientific finding, there are two different questions you can ask. You can ask, does this datum suggest the existence of God? Or you can ask, is this compatible with the existence of God? And these are they seem similar. They're, they have very different results. Let me take one fact that 99% of all the species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct. Does this fact suggest that an omniscient and omnipotent and perfectly benevolent God has designed our world? Not at all. I mean, that's probably the last thing you would infer from such a fact. But ask the other question. Ask, is, it, is this this fact compatible with the existence of the biblical God? The answer to that question, of course, is yes, and it is always yes. You simply must add caveats like, who can understand the will of God? He may have wanted to destroy his creation uh, for some, some reason that surpasses our understanding. And of course, you can do this with hu human events. You, you look at the Holocaust. Would a reasonable person looking at the Holocaust at the fact that millions of people were herded into ghettos and terrorized and then murdered and reduced to ash by their neighbors, would you, would you look at that series of events and say, well, there's probably an omniscient and perfectly benevolent and all-powerful God taking an interest in human affairs? <laughs> you wouldn't. But, but is it compatible with the biblical God? Of course. You simply must say God was very pissed off at the Jews or we have something called free will, and God could not deny the Nazis such a golden opportunity to sin. 
Who can understand the will of God? As scientists, I think we have to observe that there is a profound difference between acquiring a picture of the world through dispassionate analysis of the facts and acquiring it through patent emotionality and wishful thinking and then only then looking to see if it can survive contact with the facts. Given the gaps in science and given the elasticity of religious thinking, it will always be possible to reconcile the most gratuitous nonsense with our modern scientific worldview. This is not the same thing as having scientific reasons to believe in God. So in conclusion, I just want to give you a sense of what is, is motivating these remarks and my participation here at the meeting. Because I, I'm afraid that we can lose everything we have. I, I don't just mean personally. I, I, I'm talking collectively. I think we can lose a civilization that functions most of the time by the rules of basic human sanity. I mean, you, you might think we haven't quite achieved that, but and maybe we, we haven't, not quite. But look at how so much of the world lives at this moment. Look at, look at the mayhem born in the name, largely in the name of, of what people believe about God. I mean, look, look at what life is like in Iraq and Afghanistan. So much of this world is consumed by violence, and so much of this violence is born of the religious fragmentation of the human community. I mean, the thing that I'm most worried about now is this religious fragmentation and the religious, fra the, the religious impediments to clear thinking. At the, the, the religious willingness on the part of millions to rationalize the violent sacrifice of their own children by recourse to fairy tales. And religion allows this. So it just seems to me obvious that the, the history of our civilization is not yet written, and there is no guarantee that the religious maniacs of the future will not be the ones to write it. Now, in a later session, I, I uh, plan to talk about ethics and how I view spiritual experience, because I think uh, that these are real domains of inquiry. It's not all just mumbo-jumbo. Uh, to say they're real domains of inquiry is to say that, that they can be explored very much in the spirit of science and without dogmatism. Uh, but briefly, I, I'll just say that the best in us does not require the worst in us. We, our, our love of other human beings does not need to be nurtured by delusion. And yet we are hearing continuously from every corner of our culture that delusion is all we have. Delusion deserves our respect. Delusion is holy. It's not true. Thank you very much.